I really believe that you drink whatever the hell you want and leave the rest of it alone. If you if you don't like black IPAs, don't shit on black IPAs. I mean, just don't drink them. And that was Mark from Drecker Brewing Company on this week's episode of Brew Roots. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Brew Roots, where we tell the stories behind your favorite beer. This is Sound Guy Ryan, and joining me as always is Erica and Matt. That's right. We're here. Here we are. It's been a, quite a week. Oh, it's been a week. We um, did lots of drinking. Ryan is <laughs> officially done with school. Um, I got the official word. Oh, so official congratulations word. again. Yep. Oh, Thank you. Um, you're a master. I am a master. Yes. A master I, I am, of I'm, sound. I'm, I'm master technically, sound. if you want to really be technical, I'm the smartest one here. Technically, I mean, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. on paper, yeah, on paper, <laughs> on paper. I'm, I'm, Wait, you don't have a master's degree? No, neither do I. I <laughs> five. <laughs> all I am is an educated yes. idiot. That's all you gotta say. Well, on paper, Ryan, you are an educated idiot. Absolutely. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Seriously. So I'm sure many of our followers and listeners um, have read um, uh, all the posts that they've seen out there from Rat Magnet, uh, Brian Allen from Notch. Um. Yeah, it's, it's been a tough week to read a lot of those posts. Um, and we're here to kind of just spread the word that we want to be a positive change in the industry uh, across the board, right? You know, whether it's speaking up um, or giving the right resources to people out there who have experienced any sort of discrimination or abuse or just not feeling like they belong. Because um, there's no space for that in any industry whether it's music right it's not just the beer industry you know that's what's being highlighted you know this past week but um you know this issue is worldwide and it's in every industry yeah and you know we're not here to play uh the judge the jury or the executioner right you know there's there are two sides to every story um and we want our listeners to be informed of you know some of the resources out there so uh you know we always joke in the doobly doo below but but seriously in the in the link below um, we are going to list a few of the resources. Um, I know the Brewers Association has a code of conduct that um, needs to be utilized. Yeah, and um, they also have a resource where you can, you know, tell, uh, report whatever you've seen. Yeah, absolutely. Or experienced. Um, and if you're lucky enough that you work in um, a place of work, you know, whether you work in myself in the engineering field that has a an HR department or something like that, um, you know, we encourage you to report these things because, you know, whether these story, all these stories are true or, or, or none of these stories are true, you know, you need to report these because people need to be held accountable and, and ultimately people need to be kind and, and humans, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I think this is what this comes down to. Uh, you know, we got to leave this place better than we, we received it and... Uh, yeah, I think uh, say if you see something, say something, and uh, just be a, a human. Yeah. So uh, you know, I don't, I don't have much more to talk about this week. Um, we have a longer episode with our friends Drucker. Um, Ryan, are you okay with going to the interview? Absolutely. Yeah. So just as always, support local, and be kind, and be kind, and get ready for mass reopening. That's right. May 29th. What? what? And, uh, you know, we'll see you on the outro because I'm sure we'll be a lot less more professional than this. <laughs> and uh, cheers. Cheers. Welcome, everyone. Thank you once again. You've made it through our intro, which is. It's oh, always a feat. It's always a feat when that, we have so listeners who've made it to the, great job. the meat and potatoes, if you will, of this interview. <laughs> um, and I'm very excited because we at Brew Roots, we have a mission. We wanted to get. 50 breweries from 50 different states. Yep. Um, and we got one in a state that I desperately want to go to for no reason other than like, I just want to go to this state. I've, a, I've told people, <laughs> no, no, like I've told people like, I want to go to North Dakota. Cool. I, I don't know why. Yeah. I mean, and I think I'm, is it, is it the movie? Does, does that, the, the correct answer, I think, um, Mark is looking for is the beer. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I want to go, <laughs> I want to go to Trekker. No, yes. uh, um, yeah, no, that is a huge reason. Uh, but yeah, I, I like the movie, I guess. But uh, Fargo, if you will. Yeah, Fargo. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. It's new. It's new. It's the not place. new. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, so, Mark, what's up? 
Oh, happy to be here with you guys. This is fun to talk about. I'd love to talk about all the things that I think make Fargo an awesome place in North Dakota, a cool state. Yeah, I would awesome. love to actually learn more about that. Um, but before we get into that, um, can you just introduce yourself real quick? Tell us your role at the brewery and uh, your first memory of beer. Oof. Um, so my name is Mark Bjornsson. I'm one of the uh, co-founders and the president at Drecker Brewing Company. Um, and my first memory of beer... Mark, it's weird, that, it's weird that you said that. It says you're the captain of the Drecker ship. So I, 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 we have some, <laughs> we have some conflicting reports on your role now. So, yeah, we we trade them around like they're like revolving, you know, musical chairs of titles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we try to be a little bit grandiose and cheeky about that. Um, yeah, my first memory of beer. Um, you know, I remember, uh, I remember when I was a little kid, my dad just, uh, you know, he had his like very specific style of beer that he drank. Um, and he would literally only drink that when like friends or people were over and I just seeing how, ex- I just, I remember how excited he was to, to drink that beer with his friends and stuff. And I think that's probably one of my first memories of beer I see. Where, where I figured something was going on here. <laughs> do you, do you recall that, that said beer, the one that he's excited about? Well, that's Grain Belt Primos. That's the, I don't know if you, you guys probably don't have that on Massachusetts. No, it does not ring a bell. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Grain Belt's the brewing company. It's now brewed by uh, Shells, um, which is the second oldest continuously operated private brewery in the country. Oh, thank um, cool. y- y- Yingling first. Yeah. Yeah. first. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's Grain Belt Premium. Nice. 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 All right. So I am always curious. I think a lot of people, they look at the map and I know where North Dakota is, right? Like it's, yeah, at, the top. it's, north. it's at the top, but so. what makes North Dakota and specifically Fargo cool and, and like a, a destination for beer? I mean, when you, you look at the lists, you know, your hop culture or whatever, you know, the, and I don't care about those lists, right? Like <laughs> I, they really make no difference. Uh, I don't particularly see like North Dakota in the top 10, you know, or, you know, that, that list. Why is this a beer destination right now? And why, why? Yeah. You know, what I think makes North Dakota and Fargo cool is, um, it's, it's a really approachable place. It's, um, sometimes I think it's maybe harkens back to, you know, more of the community focused area of like how I grew up. Um, but also I think that, I think there's some progressive aspect to that too, that that's what I think what that's what a lot of people are trying to get back to where, People are friendly. Um, it's all about community, um, getting out and celebrating together. And one thing that I think makes Fargo awesome about that is that a lot of people think about our winters up here and think, how could we live? Um, and, you know, they, they wonder like, is the tap room dead when it's, when it's 20 <laughs> below and no one will come out? Like actually the tap room is probably at its most packed during a blizzard and during that stuff, because people want to get out, they want to get warm. They want to be around each other. And it, and it makes you uh, congregate and want to celebrate around each other. Cause can't be outside, you know, doing other stuff. So it brings people together too. And that's really what I think Fargo is all about. And Fargo is this cool little, um, Island of, of its own thing. There's, there's not much around it. This is an agricultural, you know, area community. So it's a lot of farmland, uh, but Fargo is just this sweet little weird town where lots of fun stuff happening, lots of cool people doing uh, crazy stuff. And, um, it's a really great place that, uh, we, we get to call home. Yeah. Talk about people congregating. You have three other, you know, on your staff. I hear, I see Darren, I see Jesse, and then I see Mason. Talk about how you guys, your, your path intertwined. It says you guys are friends brewing in a garage. Um, is it just that or, or what, what, what more was it? No, I mean, really, um, what brought us together to brew in the garage was really to start the brewery. We, we weren't just accidentally doing that stuff. Um, we were either living elsewhere, um, you know, had been, you know, just moved back after school or we're looking at getting back to Fargo. And you know, this is our earlier two thousands when tap rooms were starting to become a thing. The craft beer scene was coming up and that was something that we, we really loved about the craft beer scene was, was how it, how it could bring people together, how breweries were becoming, you know, community third spaces. Um, and that, that most recently, you know, if you think about friends had been a coffee shop, but then Wi-Fi had killed that in coffee shops and we we just loved that energy that um that community and camaraderie that that ha- we were seeing start to happen or happen around craft beer i um, mean we wanted to um be a part of bringing that to fargo and um the f- the four of us that started it had this shared idea of what we were doing this um 
this purpose for why we were going to do it. Uh, and we all happen to have kind of what we figured were four corners of the brewery in our professional background and, um, and our, our passion and expertise. And so, um, we put it together and, um, you know, pretty much bought a brewery pilot system and installed it in my garage and then spent two years working on recipes, getting the business together, getting this vision dialed in and really honing in on what we were going to, what, what this thing was that we were going to try and create. Nice. Uh, so you created Drecker. Was that the original name for the the brewing company? Did you guys have like a plan B name that somebody in Rhode Island had or so oh, on and so forth? No, I don't think we ever got sniped on like the, the name we always wanted. Oh, lucky. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but we had, uh, I mean, we had chalkboards and whiteboards that were just, I mean, you sit around and have a couple of beers and we, you can rip out a hundred names. Like what about, right. and, so we, we talked about a lot of different stuff and a lot of that danced around, you know, what our overall brand vision was going to be and, and what, what were we, how are we going to tie this fabric um, into the community and what was the story going to be around that? Hmm. Is that is where the Viking kind of thing came from or? Yeah. So, you know, North Dakota and Minnesota, there's a, there's a huge population of, of people that emigrated from Scandinavia. They were mm-hmm. out here. And um, so there's a lot of uh, Scandinavian culture in our community. Um, there's um, uh, just a lot of elements of that. There's museums around that stuff. And so we wanted something that hearkened to that a little bit, but um, also, also told another, another part of the story where we we're trying to go. So Drecker is a, as a word, um, it, it has some references to like that Viking dragon ship. Um, and so there's a big rebuilt Viking ship and that somebody sailed all the way to Norway and it's in a museum now. It's just this really cool element of, of, of our community. And then Drecker as uh, part of its other, the root word Drek means that's to drink. That's like the verb in Old Norse and in, in, okay. in Icelandic, uh, Icelandic, which is like the current language that's closest to Old Norse or that Scandinavian root language. Um, Drecker is the term for what it means to go out and share, like share a drink around a table and kind of the camaraderie and, and to drink with friends. And so we loved all of those elements getting put together. Didn't really have to mean anything to that. Cause that was going to be the whole intention of what we were driving out anyway. <laughs> that's where, that's where we landed on that one. Very cool. Yeah, I love it. Awesome. I love the message there. Yeah. Uh, what year did you guys first open? Uh, so we, we opened our first brewery uh, in October of 2014. Wow. So right before everything took off, beers were still kind of in bombers at that point. <laughs> uh, the 16 ounce yeah. cans didn't take off a, a little bit later, but uh, yeah. what were the, some of the first beers that you brewed? And are those still in rotation today? Um, so when we first opened, um, you know, we were doing a couple different versions of like American IPAs. Uh, we had an uh, Irish red, uh, a black IPA. I really thought that black IPAs at that time were going to be the next IPA. I still hope they are. We I love them. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, we, we actually did a collab a few years ago where we took our current flagship IPA recipe and uh, pretty much just subbed out some base malt and put in a little bit of like Carafa three on, you know, de husk de nice. uh, black. And it was, it was everything I ever wanted the black IPA to be. <laughs> yes, it was. It, it was good for what it was. Um, and then we had, um, uh, you know, porter, um, and a few other beers, blonde ale that we that we ro- uh, rotated around. And then very quickly we started um, getting into sours um, yep. shortly after opening. Now, are you guys uh, kettle souring, or is it all? Uh... Um, so all of the beers that you probably know us for are all kettle soured. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, we have a huge warehouse of. Um, uh, mixed and spontaneous from sours that are going right now. Cool. Uh, we've released cool. a few of them over there, but those are probably, some of those are still, we have about a three year time horizon on a few of those beers. So there may be a year or two wow. away. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So those beers that you mentioned, yeah, you know, you said the blonde, the, the black IPA, are any of those, uh, still on tap today? Do you harken back to those recipes or completely different? Um, so we still make our, uh, our Irish red that's broken rudder. Um, mm-hmm. that's one of our most popular beers around here. It's just a super approachable kind of that Irish red pub ale. Yeah. Um, and then we still make our Porter out of that. That's pillager Porter. Nice. Um, and so the, both, both of those are still really popular in Fargo and really popular at the tap room. Um, but we make about, I think last year we did 125 different beers, oh, uh, nice. over the year and, and 80 to 90 of those were just brand new. Wow. So we keep, we keep them around, but there's a heavy mix. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it. So has the, uh, the hazy IPA craze taken over there or, uh, not yet? 
Oh yeah. No. So we were, <laughs> we've been brewing hazy IPAs since, uh, probably 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I, I love drinking American IPAs. Um, I never felt, I'd say I want, we wanted, we wanted to make a ton of different beers. We wanted to Clearly. always use <laughs> and I, and I, I just, I, I never felt like an American IPA was a good way, a good platform to do that. You know, if you get a good American IPA, you stick with that. There's, there's balance and there, there's, I don't think people want to have seven American IPAs or West coast IPAs on of the 14 taps they have. That <laughs> yeah. I don't you think have, customer, you haven't been to Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> to me, I mean, and maybe that's personally, I just, yeah. I, I don't want to drink five different American IPAs in succession because just we personally nature, would agree. <laughs> yeah. Just the nature of how those beers are built. By the fourth right. one, I can't even taste what hops this is anymore. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's hop. not bad. It's just you get hot burnt out. It's like you get hot burnt. Yeah, yeah. your palate's yeah. burnt yeah. out. I was get like you get fuzzy tongue yeah. off, off <laughs> right. of that. Um, but with hazy IPAs, uh, it's phenomenal. I mean, it, it that's all you want to do is make different ones and try different ones. And so uh, we did our our first hazy we were working on in 2016, and um, so th- that was Wheeze the Juice. And once you know, back then that was barely something people were talking about. There was tons of folklore and, <laughs> um, you know, like, is it the chloride Rumblings. level? Is it the folklore? <laughs> is it the chloride that makes the softness or what, you know, how much oat or wheat or, you know, what's the secret and yeah. people putting always flour. Getting, yeah. Yeah. Putting flour in there to get permanent haze. There's, I mean, there's tons of stuff. Is it Conan or is it London ale three? And, right. um, you know, it was kind of like everyone kind of talked about, there was like a secret ingredient that was always involved in it's like just what it happens to be is there's like 18 different variables. That you yes. just have to <laughs> dial in and, um, so then since then we've just ripped out a million of them yeah. and we, we love hazy IPAs. That's, um, yeah, they're phenomenally popular out here. And we were kind of one of the first ones that pushed that forward and, and we love them. Yeah. Cool. Before we get into your sour program and what the beers that people know you from, we have to get a quick word from our sponsors. So take it away. Sound guy, Ryan. <laughs> Did you know that your favorite Massachusetts breweries use hops from a local family-owned hop farm right here in Massachusetts? Our friends over at Four Star Farms are there for you whether you're a commercial brewery or a small batch home brewer. Make sure to head over to their website today and get your hands on some of the best and freshest hops available locally. Cheers! Cheers. At our local homebrew shop, Beer and Wine Hobby, you can get everything you need to make beer, wine, cider, cheese, and more. Not sure where to start? They have knowledgeable staff there to help. Beer and Wine Hobby is family-owned and located in Danvers, Massachusetts. Visit their website, beer-wine.com, and use our promo code BREWS for 10% off your online order today. Shirks on Tap is the box subscription service where you can get some of the dopest brewery t-shirts out there. I'm talking breweries from Dallas, San Diego, and even our home area of New England. And you might ask, how do I get my hands on some? To get your first box for $5, click the link below in our description, or head on over to our website, breweries.com. Remember, drink better beer, wear better shirts. All right, so you got me thirsty for some Hazy Boys, which... Check we my pulse. Usually. Like, make sure. I mean, like, are you okay? okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I love a good sour, um, especially when a kettle sour is done well. Mm. Um, you guys are known for the sour game that you guys are putting out. Um, are sours big in, in in North Dakota right now, or um, are you guys kind of on the forefront of that, like you were with you know hazy IPAs, New England Isle style? Um, I, I mean, I, I think we definitely drive the market out here. We're the largest brewery, one of the oldest in the states our sours are really popular out here and you know, they fill the brewery and um, we have a lot of fun with them. So they're, they're, you know, it's, it's a, we had to get people used to those. Um, but I think as a country, you know, as a whole American craft beer scene, those were, you know, around 2015 is when we were pushing those out. Mm. That was kind of hard to describe to people. Like they hadn't heard of sour. Ales <laughs> right? before. Like, yeah. You shouldn't call this sour. Then they, they think of it immediately like sour milk and yeah. <laughs> Like, let's call them tart ales. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, no, they're they're huge. 
it's always interesting. We have a couple of breweries out here that ha- use passion fruit in their sours. I think last week I, ch- I talked to Erica and we don't actually know what passion fruit tastes like. Correct? <laughs> yeah. There's like a, a couple different fruits. I just are like, what are these? Or guava. Or guava. Can or, you explain um, what yeah. passion fruit tastes like in beer and what's the intended purpose for passion fruit? So we always joke about, uh, well, guava to us is like an insurance policy. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's always going to be awesome. It's going to make everything better. It's got yeah. this great body to it. Every then, hazy IPA, New England style IPA, is like, we have guava or pineapple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mango. Okay. All right. I know what those two taste like, but guava, I mean, like. Yeah. Guava also happens to be one of the cheapest fruits available. So oh, that, yes. that's, I mean, that's a reason why it gets used a lot. Yeah. Right. Um, but, uh, but passion fruit is one of the most expensive fruits yeah, that's available. Yeah. And I mean, it is just, it's freaking amazing. It's passion fruit to me tastes like, um, incredibly intense, um, very tart, like mango tropical fruit, um, flavor. It's, it's like when you get that perfect, sweet, almost tart mango mm-hmm. passion fruit is that concentrated in times 10. It, it's right. just, it, there's a, just a massive intensity to it. It's also a super weird fruit to eat. Cause it's comes in like these little, you know, little Hard fruit things, things yeah. you, you cut them in half and it it looks like like alien innards in oh, yeah. it, it, it's like <laughs> yellow i mean it's kind of it's really similar to um pomegranate where you're kind of eating these seeds mm. um but you know pomegranate holds together almost like a corn kernel right yeah um uh passion fruit is like Mush. gel it's like <laughs> gel that's just around this seed and uh but yeah i mean they're just it we joke sometimes that like we're pretty sure we could just if we put enough passion fruit in a beer we could call it a sour and we wouldn't even have to sour, sour it yep. yeah. <laughs> because it, it's so intensely tart yeah. and it's, it's great. It comp, it complements that lactic, uh, mm. lactic tartness, uh, mm. from a, from a kettle sour, just really well. And so it, it, it's amazing. Yeah. And your, um, sour beers, if you can tell us, is there any specific kind of uh, yeast strain that you use for those or. Yeah. So we have a house, um, okay. sour culture that mm-hmm. we keep alive. Um, so that was one of the things that like back in 2015, we were, we were one of the first breweries working on and we worked with our, our, um, our micro lab and then a few other breweries across the country when, when kettle sour started getting really popular, um, they had only ever really been done as, I mean, it was a really niche beer. It was barely ever done. It was sometimes yeah. done as, as a one-off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we wanted to push these out into, you know, always be making one. And there was not a lot known about how do you keep a sour culture going this for kettle souring. Yeah. And uh, so we worked for about, about nine months with our lab and these other breweries all troubleshooting this. And so in the six years that we've had that going, I think we've only killed that mother culture once or twice. Well, um, for you guys. And so then, and we have the bill, we can just reboot it and start right, over again. But right. we keep that going all the time. Um, that we, it, it, it produces the sour profile that we like. It does it in the time frame that we need it to do it. Um, and um, it, it, it works really well. So mm-hmm. we have our own house souring culture that we use. And then depending on the sour that we're doing, uh, we might use a variety of different yeast strains. Um, yeah. We keep about three or four uh, in the in our brewery all the time for different purposes. But most of the time we're using our house ale strain. For that, we want something that's pretty neutral. Um, we need something that's also... a really healthy and tolerant yeast strain because all of that acid and stuff that's built up in the sour beer, that's, that's there right at the start of fermentation for the yeast. Gotcha. That's pre- it's pretty toxic mm. to yeast. It, it makes it a inhospitable environment for them. Mm. So you, you need something that's pretty hardy, pretty strong. Um, you know, there's some yeast strains out there that are really great for the delicacy that they produce, uh, but they're, they're relatively fragile. Mm. Um, so we need to, we need something that can tolerate that acidity. Yeah. So we, we use our house ale strain, which is kind of an American, uh, just kind of a super producing American ale strain. Cool. Are you pasteurizing the sours at all? Or uh, how are you preventing from re-fermentation in the can? Or have you had that issue? Um, so we don't, uh, I don't think that any one mechanism like that is going to be a fail safe uh, for you. Um, so we, we've kind of developed our own, um, we kind of, it's three prongs that we use uh, on that. So there's three different treatments, kind of process things that we do to our sours to prevent any re-fermentation. Um, obviously, we don't talk a lot about what all of that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to go into it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a huge problem. And um, honestly, I would say over the 
two to four million cans of sour ales we put out in the last two years. Um, we've maybe heard of one or two incidents where a beer maybe re-fermented and that was usually um, it got put up in a kitchen cupboard or a hot car for yeah. like a month. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, I, oh, and I think that at a certain point that might just be a pressure issue. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we've never had like the exploding can. We've only had like the, the slow kind of little gushes over. Right. Yeah. Right. That. But yeah, we, we were, you know, we've been doing fruited sours for a long time, but they weren't always these crazy mm. level fruited sours. <laughs> and so um, when we, when we, kind of inched out our first ones of those crazy ones. Um, and, and they took off. We actually like what dialed way back on how much we put out and spent about six months figuring out how we were going to get this figured out. If you go into the boiler room at the brewery, it, it's like a library of beer releases because yeah. all of our, all of we've got can lots from almost every beer we've released and they're sitting in the boiler room, which is you know always about 90 degrees and they're all pristine sitting there looking like the good, day they went good. in. Good. So you guys clearly know a good amount of what you're doing. Is there any kind of education that you d- you went and did to uh, learn all this information? Is just trial by error? Um, you know, we talk about like the internet. It's, a, it's an amazing <laughs> thing. If you have right. enough time, you can teach yourself <laughs> anything. Um, but yeah, my, my background's in microbiology and, and um, biochemistry. And, and so that, 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 I mean, just produces at least... I'd say it doesn't produce the answers, but it, 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 it teaches you though. how to yeah. start learning, how to, you know, you know, like, no, I mean, there are ways to inhibit and fermentation or this is what, you know, these processes would do. And we have to go back and teaches you, you know, how to think almost. Yeah. Well, and, and I might, I might've learned how to do that in a lab to like a single, single jar of something, but we're talking about, you know, huge hundred barrel batches of stuff but there's a scale up to that too like <laughs> yeah. some of the things i knew about like i could do that as i'm you know mixing or one that's one treated process but we're talking about major pieces of equipment here or different things that so we, there's been a lot of education and training and you know there's we have a lot of great friends in the brewing industry that are doing really similar beers to us and um you know those, those clubs stay pretty tight and we all problem solve together on some stuff what's uh frustrating for you in the beer industry right now yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, we talked about this a lot at the brewery and I don't know if it's some of the pandemic, everyone's stress, but like the internet troll, um, aspect that I think has crept into craft beer has been, it's starting to get really toxic. I mean, it's tough for some of our staff sometimes, and it's not even just our brewery. Sometimes it's friends of ours or talking about different styles. And, you know, um, I really believe that you drink whatever the hell you want and leave the rest of it alone. If you, if you don't like black IPAs, don't shit on black IPAs. I mean, just don't drink them. That's the, when, when there's, you know, 4,000 breweries in the country and everyone wants something new, but they also don't want to be shocked too much for some reason. So, I mean, if, if you ask us to do 120 new beers in a year and we're not trying to make 120 beers for, that every single person is going to like <laughs> right. going all over the place. Right. And I think sometimes, I don't know, people, people get over these like purity laws and um, get wound up and we just don't care. <laughs> we we want to make the beers, whatever we want to do. And yeah. um, I think, I think just some people that are just getting highly negative uh, about, about beer. And, and that's not what it's supposed to be. That's not why any of us right. got into this. And I mean, and that's, that's what I'm saying. If there's beer that is, absolute crap or it's it's massively flawed or whatever absolutely sure. that should be critiqued or that should be right? black yeah. or but like if you hate passion fruit and you drink a passion fruit beer and then you just go out on a rant about <laughs> you know out of your way to try and ruin this beer that's ridiculous yeah do you find that negativity more on apps like untapped to be your advocate or do <laughs> yeah. you see it more on instagram facebook now um no, actually I, I see it uh untapped is actually I think kind of chilled itself out. Um, right. it's, has it, can I, ask, I don't, can I ask this question? Has untapped chilled itself out because Instagram has become a cesspool or has, <laughs> I, well, I, actually, <laughs> I, I actually don't think Instagram is the worst either. I, I think that I think Facebook, Facebook is the worst. Okay. I, I think face, Facebook just because groups of the are pretty group, bad, right? Yeah. Yep. The groups yep. and stuff. And it, and it, it just, it becomes these dog piles um, that, yeah. that some people get into. And, and I think that with anonymity and people get real confident behind that keyboard and, mm-hmm. and, you know, a sock puppet account, um, <laughs> I, I, they just want to 
they just want to shit on some stuff. And, <laughs> yeah. and I, I think, I think that, that, that people intentionally post things to get reactions because oh, they're, yeah, they're feeding their own dopamine needs to get likes and reactions and comments. Yeah. And, um, and I, I just think like, you know, there, there's awesome people in the craft beer industry and people are really pouring their heart and passion into this stuff. Don't shit on them for doing yeah. that stuff. I mean, these are, these are real people behind these things and you know, shame on, shame on you for stepping in the way of somebody's you know pride or some product that they really put their name on. And, why don't you go out there and do your own thing? And I, so I think, I think Instagram for us, we, we mostly see Instagram be pretty positive. Um, you know, that Instagram's content based. And so yeah, Facebook's it, opinion. It, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and Facebook is a community space. It's an opinion and, and, yeah. um, you know, so yeah, I, I, but I think, you know, untapped used to be, I thought that there was a lot of people that wanted to be beer critics. And so they were started yeah. out on beer on untapped. I think everyone's kind of gotten away from that. They're, they're, they're doing it the way they like it. They might put some journal notes for themselves on there, but it's really, I think, toned down from what I see. Um, okay. Cool. But yeah. I'm glad to see that because we've, we haven't asked that particular question we in haven't. a while. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's interesting to hear since the pandemic, I think we started reintroducing that one, but uh, cause a lot of brewers were like, fuck on tap for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah no. It was, Still it was are. difficult. And yeah. I think, you know, it, as a brewer, it is, you can go through a beer and, you know, within like a week or two, we're going to have 2000 check-ins on a, on a beer that we release. And you will only remember the two comments that were negative. And so <laughs> there's a fortitude that you need to have to, to go through and handle those. Um, but I think the thing that's great about untapped too, is that it's, it's gotten such mass usage that the law of averages just take over. Yeah. And that's a good so, point. Mm-hmm. you know, they, every beer is a three, five. <laughs> so if you, I mean, if you look at a beer and, you know, it's pretty hard for your, you know, your local hype boys to influence a beer anymore, because like I said, you're going to get two, five, 6,000 check-ins on this beer. You know, the, the 10 fanboys that are always at every release, they have no impact on that anymore. Yeah. And so mm. that aspect's kind of removed and, um, it gives us really good feedback on things that we we've seen some beers that we put out that we knew were out there. And what's crazy about untapped is like, we'll go through the check-ins and it's funny. Cause it's only one stars or only five stars. No, <laughs> nobody touched. No in, between. So no in between you either loved this beer or you hated this beer. And yeah. And I like being able to, you know, rather than just looking at the average, I, I like being able to look at that metadata and see that. Cause that gives us some idea of what, like, all right, this one was a, we really hit a small target of people on <laughs> right. this beer. Yeah. <laughs> that is actually pretty cool to see. Yeah. All right. So I am curious because I want people to, when it's safe to travel abroad and go to these different beer communities, we talked about Fargo a little bit earlier, but let's, let's find out a little bit more about the food, the beer, the, the music scene, the you know, the community aspect of Fargo. But first. A word from our sponsors. Take it away, Ryan. Are you a solo artist, band, podcaster, or anyone else who needs recording services? Well, we got a place for you where your vision can become a reality. Welcome to Small Pond Studios, built by hand with heart and sweat equity by musicians for musicians. Go to smallpondstudios.io to reach out to get more information. And make sure you let them know that Brute sent you. Hey, Sound Guy Ryan here. Didn't know if you heard, but we're a part of the Hopped Up Network. There you'll find other informative podcasts about beer. So go ahead, follow them on social media, and visit them on their website, hoppedupnetwork.com, to learn more about the people, beer, and breweries from around the country. And until next time, thanks for listening. Cheers. All right, we're back. Like I said, on the other side of the sponsor bumps, um, people are going to be traveling soon. Uh, COVID is wrapping up. More and more people are getting vaccinated, and people are feeling a little bit more comfortable to go yeah. into these amazing spaces. Yeah. Um, why should people go to Fargo? What's going on with the music scene, the beer, the the food, the community? What's what's cool to do there? Yeah. So you know, there's no, um, you know, we don't have like a. Um, like major tourist attraction thing. It's just a really cool community. Um, we have a really vibrant restored downtown that's full of local restaurants and um, shops. And 
there's, they're like, you can't come here and not, um, not notice how hospitable, how, um, friendly this kind of Midwest nice is up here. Um, so I think the people are awesome and, um, there's something just really approachable about everything in Fargo. There's nothing that's, um, you know, too highbrow or even, even like our fine cuisine places are, are actually just like really casual and cool <laughs> and it's amazing food. But if you're wearing a t-shirt and jeans and you're just feeling like, um, getting a little fancy for food that night, you, there's no problems going into that restaurant. It, it's it. just really cool. So, um, I think Fargo is a really cool place for like those long weekend vacations. You want to check out a cool community, come here and have some fun, unique food. And it, it's, um, it, it's just a really cool Midwest experience. Awesome. People are nicer so, out there too. Yeah. <laughs> Much better than those Bost, Bostonians. Bostonians. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what can people, I mean, when I think of Midwestern towns, I think of, you know, your domestic beers. How did you get people into your brewery who were, you know, Drinking like green. You know, like my, my dad is loyal to Coors Light. How did you get my dad into your brewery and, and step away from Coors Light? We told him that it's cool that he drinks Coors Light. And we, <laughs> we also love that, but we don't do anything like that. <laughs> so this is, this Perfect. is different. No, I mean, we have, we have like a, we have an awesome like rice lager that we always have on tap, but nice. really we did that by trying to be something different. We're weird. We are not going to win this battle of trying to make beers just like the macro beers and convert people over to that because, you know, there's lots of reasons why people drink macro beers. It's cost, it's convenience, it's consistency. Um, it's cause it's everywhere. And, and we're never going to be that size or have that price point. We just can't do that and still be the small, you know, company that we want to be. So we wanted to be something totally different. So we produce beers that are way outside the boundaries of maybe what, what even like your dad that drinks Coors Light would even think of. So our fruited sours, um, you know, people love them cause they're like having a smoothie. Um, <laughs> mm. y- y- those hazy IPAs, those can be like this, these incredible soft, you know, fruit notes. And they're not the typical IPA that you would think of. And we convert a ton of people. They're like, ah, you know, I, I tried this IPA a few years ago and you know, it just, it was so bitter. And I'm, well, they'll say, I, I prefer fruity, you know, something like peach or whatever. We'll throw an IPA that's really peach forward at them and say, try this. I'm like, yeah, this is great. You know, what kind what kind of fruit is in this? I'm like, no, it's like a 9% double IPA and oh, it's got geez. a crazy amount of hops in it. But <laughs> yeah, so I think just kind of getting people r- way past those boundaries and into this, into these different beers. So that's, that's how we've gotten people into craft beer. That's, you know, we did it our own way. Um, we're not trying to do the same beers that are available somewhere else. We just want to do our own thing and have fun doing it. And, if we find some people that want to come along and party with us, that's, that's awesome. That's what the whole Perfect. point is. So that's what, that's what we, we've tried to build at our brewery in our tap room. And that's what we're building in the future in Fargo. Yeah. Speaking of the future, uh, what's next for you guys? What are you brewing on? Any plans for expansion? Uh, yeah, we've got some pretty, pretty big uh, plans up here. So right now uh, we're in about a 15,000 square foot, um, uh, brewery. It's a, it's a 140 year old, uh, railroad building. Oh, so it's awesome. this beautiful, beautiful brick building full of windows. It's all old brick and wood timber. Nice. Um, I don't know if you can kind of see behind me, you see yeah. some of those, yeah. I'm up the in the second there. story yeah. up there, but, um, so it's this great building, huge open space. And it, it really makes this like, we call it like this Norse beer hall feel to it. Um, we don't do any food here. Um, we don't want to do food. That's not our, not our gig. Um, but we've got some great, um, relationships in town and we have this vision for creating a even bigger destination in this community space in Fargo. So attached to the back of our brewery, um, we're building a hundred thousand square foot, uh, food hall event center and hotel. Uh, and that, we break hotel. Ground, All right. that we we break ground on in, in a couple of weeks. That's Congratulations. Awesome. That's awesome. So there you go. So that's, that's like the first brewery that I've heard has Perfect. a hotel. So we'll have um, about 20 different vendors in there. There'll be a couple restaurants, you know, like a cheesemonger, um, ice cream, artists, potters, different things like that, some retail shops. They're all small local Fargo businesses that we think um you know, either need a, need a different place or a stepping stone to, to get up from, you know, like maybe a farmer's market up yeah. to like mortar, but also we wanted to create this collaborative business community where we 
we're trying to make our own neighborhood that's just indoors 24 7 365 um, and so it's this really cool partnership with all these um, local businesses and a, a really great diverse option there. Uh, and then the event center um, gives us, you know, we love doing events. We love doing these like really tailored, um, super fun, weird events, uh, but we're busting at the seams at the brewery. So <laughs> yeah. we needed a space to do that, you know, maybe 10 times a year. Uh, and then also we have an, like, we are always inundated with people that want to have their wedding here. They want to, throw their corporate event or their Christmas party. And, um, we could shut down the brewery and have two or 300 people here, but we're not going to shut. We, we can't shut down not, the brewery. Right. No, yeah. cause that's, it's about a community. We want the, the tap rooms, a community space. That's not to be closed yeah. off on Fridays and stuff like that. So we, we needed to build that. So then now this event center gives us that opportunity to do that. That's... So there's two large event rooms, a whole mezzanine and breakout space. And then, um, honestly, we're probably one of the, we're one of the major reasons why people come to Fargo and have weekend trips here. They come out for beer releases. Yeah. Um, they're always asking us, you know, where should they eat and where should they stay? <laughs> yeah. And um, no, you're going to be like Drucker, just stay right here. here. It's, it's, right here. We, we got it all for you. <laughs> and so we wanted to provide a really cool, unique, uh, lodging experience. We wanted that to be tailorable and customizable. So we've got, um, you know, a whole bunch of these hotel rooms that are all custom designed. They're all done Ooh. with our, our, our artwork. Um, huh. Some of them, some of them tell some of the backstory behind the beers or some other little Easter eggs to so them. So we can themed really... rooms, if you will. Yep. Yeah. They'll all be individually themed. Cool. And then, um, and then you can, you know, you can have your bridge, your fridge uh, full of the new release beer that you're coming in for, That's or you can get so some, awesome. you can have fresh coffee beans from the coffee roastery downstairs, or if you want, um, if you want a bouquet of flowers waiting for you, cause it's a, a special weekend that can come up from the florist that's downstairs. And so we can really build these really cool experiences and that, and that gets, that gets closer to the core of what we want to do rather than yeah. just make beer. We, we want to create, uh, weird and fun experiences <laughs> where people enjoy their life and feel some kind of wonderment in it. And, uh, we're trying to go beyond just our, the product we're most known for. We're trying to make sure that we can catalyze every opportunity with that. Yeah, love it. Well, well said. <laughs> I don't <Done>. think <laughs> I don't think I can top this. So I don't want any listeners to think I'm an ass. But um, <laughs> the next question I had was <laughs> was uh, what about uh, seltzers? Are you guys doing hard seltzers? I, I feel like such a jerk asking that question after no, like that amazing jerk. like this is so badass. I'm so excited to actually go to Fargo and experience what you guys are going to be doing in the future. <laughs> I have to preface by saying that. So, um, we've been working on seltzers for a long time. Um, we are not going to do an alcoholic LaCroix. Um, like I said, for the same reasons that we don't, we don't brew Coors Light and try to replace those for people. Right. We see, we see an incredible opportunity in what seltzers are and how we could use that to just blow past the other barriers that we've kind of been up against before. So we're looking at seltzers as a way to do, um, gluten-free, no lactose, yeah. crazy smoothie stuff. Um, there's flavors what? that we love doing. In, there's some flavors that we love doing in our sours or we want to pull off in our sours, but with the sour base or that tartness that's in there, it doesn't land quite right. You know, for fruit or things yeah. like that, it's un unbelievable. It, 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 it really elevates that flavor. So like what? There's is, some more. Sorry, not to cut you off. Um, it, Go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, I think chocolate, we, we use a lot of chocolate. But every once in a while with, with some of the, some of the directions we want to go with that at a certain point, chocolate doesn't work anymore. You, mm, you, you need yeah. chocolate to be with it. It needs to be with like a ton of fruit so that the fruit kind of takes that acidity and the chocolate stays separate. But I'd say on that savory end, um, you know, savory or decadent end, um, chocolate, things like that. Um, there's a, we also want to bridge into, um, uh, let's say, mocktails or not Ooh, yeah like, so like i think there's tails? some really yeah, yeah so i mean we could recreate um we could re recreate all kinds of things you know like i love tiki drinks um we love old fashions and vucarets think you know those classic cocktails and there's ways we can recreate that it, when we have a 20 percent seltzer base um that we can use and so there's really fun things that we can do with that and then we're we've been working for a long time on uh, on ways to get beer totally out of your glass and into a whole other realm. And so, um, we work, we've been working a lot on soft serve, 
Um, oh, I don't mean yeah. I don't mean slush. I mean slushies. Okay. I mean, yeah, we've heard of some people breweries just starting to do the soft serve. That's pretty cool. Yep, straight up soft serve, and you need for that to still be what we think of as as beer or alcohol. You know, I, I that can't be a one percent alcohol ice cream cone to me. That <laughs> needs to be. You know, we want to put produce a five six percent alcohol cone. Uh, yeah, there's a brewery <laughs> around here that's been do, that's doing stouts on a. Yep. Yeah, which is gonna yep. be crazy. <laughs> And so That's you cool. can't, so you need something like a seltzer base to almost help okay. get that alcohol back up. So we're, there's some breweries, you know, I know some, I know some like brew pubs that are doing them and they're using like a bar where they're using, you know, distilled alcohol yeah. to beef that up. But, yeah. but we're, a, we're a brewery, we can't do any of that stuff. So we have to do it just through the beer we can make. And so that's, that's where we start seeing seltzers play into that. And um, so there'll be some crazy smoothies, some mocktails. We'll probably have, um, we do a quite a bit of, uh, cold brew coffee and like nice. oat, milk, oat milk lattes that we have yeah. on tap here at the brewery. Mm-hmm. Um, currently those are alcohol free, but now we can offer a like oat milk, a hard, lat- version. A hard, hard oat milk latte, nice. things cool. like that. And so now when we get into the event center and when we're trying to do events and weddings or, or some of these custom theme things, we can even go into using that to make, you know, custom designed craft kind of beer cocktails for them and there's no limits on what we can do really with that's awesome when we start using seltzer base for that yeah that's awesome super excited you've talked a lot about giving back to the community right you know you you want to be a community space um but what is the fargo north dakota um beer scene community like oh what what i I thought you were going charity with that but now you're going (laughs) for like the beer scene okay yeah, no, I mean, Fargo's got a great beer scene. Um, there's a really cool mix of breweries here where everyone's kind of doing their own thing. Um, a lot of us started around the same time and there's, um, there's a lot of, you know, community events that we get involved with. There's a like phenomenal farmer's market that most all of us are at every Saturday in the summer and serving beers. And it's just, it's fun to have these overlapping areas where we get to hang out together and do that stuff. Um, and then, you know, we're, um, we're kind of out here by ourselves. We're not, um, we're not in like a major, major metro area. So mm-hmm. it's nice to have a good group of breweries around here. Cause every once in a while, you know, you, a pallet of this kind of grain shows up two days or is, is coming two <laughs> days later. And so we, we help yeah. each other out with that stuff. And, and that's, that's, what's great about the, cool. the brewing scene is that, um, you know, you can lean on each other for things like that, help each other out. And, and then we also, um, at the end of the day, we don't always want to drink our own beers. We, yeah. we want different stuff. And, um, you know, we know the beers that we make and that's kind of been our brand. Um, yeah. because of that, there's, there's certain beers we just probably aren't going to do. Uh, but it doesn't mean we don't love them. So it's awesome having other breweries that have a whole, you know, different ways of doing it, different, um, beliefs around that. And like, like I said, American IPAs, American IPAs just don't really fit into what I think Drecker is going to be doing on our thing, but there's, there's a couple of breweries in town that make phenomenal American IPAs. And so I love going cool. there and having a few of them. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of leads into uh, one of our questions. What is in your beer fridge at home? What are you drinking? Um, so I, when I'm at home, I don't really traditionally drink beer. Okay. Um, I, 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 <laughs> what do I, you I, drink? Not, <laughs> some guy Ryan's <laughs> holding his head. Yeah. Yeah. The, this, I mean, as you can probably imagine, I'm not home that much. Right. Uh, right. I, I, I'm, I'm here a lot. Uh, my beer fridge always has a lot of the new releases and Drecker stuff because mm-hmm. the neighbors come over and they're usually just shocked if I don't, cause they're coming <laughs> over looking for one of my beers or a beer they right. couldn't get at the release. And so right. I, I try to keep some of those around, but those are more for like the friends and neighbors that stop over. Um, personally, um, if I'm drinking at home, it's probably bourbon scotch, or I'm making like a painkiller or, um, <laughs> like a, an old fashioned or something nice, for myself. Nice. That's Love my it. jam. Yeah. yeah. Ryan, you got a question. Ryan's into it. Yes. I want to know, what do you want to learn more about? Yeah. Um, you know, so as a brewer, I think one of the things I, I really want to learn more about and then that I try to get into is yeah, as we build up a barrel age, I mean, we have a barrel age stouts are another huge part mm, of, yeah. of what we do. Uh, I'm always trying to learn more about about the distilling world and, and what's going into you know, why they're selecting the certain wood that they're doing or the char level, what, what it is in the, in the different mash bells that they're, they're creating. Because, uh, I, I mean, I love learning about why they did that for the spirit that they did, but then I love learning because now I'm going to try and take that barrel and there's remnants of those things they did. And 
and I, we can capitalize on the reason why they selected their barrels, what they think they do for them. Right. Uh, you know, a different distillery has a, you know, a different approach to it, a different thing. And, and we can take, you know, we like building a diverse uh, library of barrels and it's really cool then to, to see that come together. You know, they spend 18 months, our beer spends 18 months in those barrels. And when we learn really well from those distilleries, uh, we can pull that off in some really cool blends and then we can produce. And I love, I love Sweet. learning from the distilling world. Yeah, it's, it's completely different. Oh. It's so cool. Yeah. But it melds really well with beer. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to kind of bring the two together. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, so I want people, as we mentioned, I'm sure, you know, we want people to go to Fargo. We want yeah. people to go to Drucker. Yeah. Um, and we want people to experience a new beer scene. Uh, so where are you physically located? Uh, in Fargo, North Dakota, we're, uh, our address is 1666, uh, first Avenue North. We're just West of like what would be considered downtown Fargo. So maybe a couple blocks outside of downtown. We're kind of in this older industrial park area. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can look us up. I mean, hit up our Instagram and Facebook and, and web website. Uh, cool. that'll get you all the information about coming here. And, um, we, we love getting messages from people too, like as they're planning these trips about, you know, when they're thinking about coming, where should they stay? What restaurants should they hit up? We're always happy to give recommendations and share some of our favorite places <laughs> to go. Love um, it. which I, I think to me, even when I go to like New York city, I don't want to do the, the, the tourist stuff. I want to get right. the insider trips. Yeah, I want to exactly. know like, right, what's that hole in the wall bar where you guys hang yes. out. Cause that's yeah. the experience I want. I want to see that stuff in another city, another community. Uh, right. We're happy to share that stuff. All right, Mark, I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh. <laughs> I want to know the the most towny bar to go to when I go to Fargo. I want to know the best place to get a burger in Fargo, Ooh. and I want to know the best place to get dumplings in Fargo. <laughs> yes. Uh, so dumplings might have a different thing here because there's some like German overlap. We have a thing called oh. Spetz. We oh, I know. Like, I know what Spetz. Yeah. Is. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. So that's so, that's good. We'll classify that. We'll yeah, take that. We'll take so, that. So, uh, there's a place called worst beer hall. It's this phenomenal, Love um, it. German kind of modern steampunk bar place. It's Fuck awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. uh, I, I can kick two, probably almost three with that one. It's one of our favorite places to hang out and drink beer. Sweet. Uh, they, they've got this awesome Spetzel. You can get traditional Spetzel with gravy or you can get Spetzel mac and cheese. Um, yes. our old, our old brewery used to be next door to them. And the Drecker special was the Spetzel Mac with the jalapeno cheddar bratwurst on it. <laughs> cause, cause yes. we ordered it every <laughs> single day for lunch. Oh my God. That's awesome. So I think they have a phenomenal burger. And then there's, cool. um, uh, there's a, there's an OG like hole in the wall place in, in Fargo or in Fargo Moorhead called, uh, the high ho. And they make these just awesome, greasy, hole-in-the-wall dive bar yes. uh, burgers. Perfect. So that's great. And then I think like the the like towny bar is is probably going to be um, if you're in like service industry, it's going to be Duffy's. Um, it's this cool. little tiny kind of Irish bar. Um, Love it. Super super awesome place to hang. Cool. Awesome. So you heard it here first, some brewers. Well, probably not if you're in the industry. If you know, you know. But you heard it here if you're from Massachusetts or right, beyond. Right. Um, Mark, thanks for doing this today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, this was awesome. This was a lot of fun for us. Um, and we can't wait to get our hands on some of your beer to, to try it firsthand. Yeah. But yeah. Erica. Can't wait. Um, so we always end our interviews with this last question. What are you most proud of? Uh, I'm most proud of uh, the team that we have here. And the community that's kind of come around the brewery, it's, it's really great to have this idea of what we were trying to do, but there's nothing more rewarding to, or rewarding to me than um, finding other people along the way that want to come along and they add their own aspect to that. They make it bigger than it was ever going to be just yourself. Yeah. And, and that's to me where the whole thing snowballs. And that's the point of what we're doing is finding our own little freak parade along the way and, and everyone having adding something and making this thing bigger than the whole. Couldn't say Perfect. Better myself. I love it. That was awesome. Yeah, seriously. Mark, thanks again for Thank doing you this. So much. Thanks for having me. This is a blast. We Anytime. hope to make it out to Fargo. And if not, we cross paths in Massachusetts. That'd be rad too. I was going to say, come out, come crash where, on my where, coach. Where are you guys at in Massachusetts? Uh, just North of Boston, just North of Boston, yeah. but you can get anywhere in an hour and you'll get yep. good beer. I yeah. mean, you can go yeah. anywhere in 15 minutes. All yeah. Massachusetts beers. isn't like Texas where it takes, you know, five, six hours to get across the street. Massachusetts. I mean, max of like two and a half, three hours. Yeah. 
So well, like, we get out we get out to the East Coast quite a bit. So yeah. Oh yeah. Come party with us. Love it. We're down. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, thanks for having me. No awesome. problem. Thanks. Well, cheers. 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 Well, 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 it's Ryan's least favorite part of the podcast. Only if you could see my face right now. The outro. Thank God it's not a video podcast because Ryan is just shaking his head left and right. He's so mad. His hair is flowing in the breeze. It's actually a sight to be seen. <laughs> but uh, we have an episode lined up for you this week that we're actually going to tell you. Dun, dun, dun. It's the beer that I drank heavily yesterday and Ryan is currently drinking right now. Erica, do you want to spoil it for our listeners? You bet I do. Well, go ahead. It's Cigar City down in Florida. That's right. And we've been having to do these, these you know, far away episodes virtually. Mm. And don't get me wrong. We like doing them virtually. They're fun. But we want to do them in person. Yeah. Restrictions are getting lifted and we're, we're feeling a little bit more comfortable. We are. But we don't got any money. And the <laughs> only way that we can do some of these virtual interviews is support from our awesome listeners. Uh, so we have a Patreon. It's www.patreon.com forward slash Brew Roots Podcast. Um, and we also have some other avenues. You know, if you want some merch, we have some t-shirts and some sweatshirts available for sale. So uh, hit us up, let us know, and uh, help us out because we want to continue doing these podcasts, you know, far and away. Yeah. yeah. So until next week, uh, be kind to people, do your job, and uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.